Welcome, friends. James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com, with another edition of Propaganda Watch. And this week, we're going to be looking at the latest from the IPCC, specifically their special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius, which was released too much hype and fanfare over the course of the past week. Uh, and for people who are paying attention at home, uh, this will not be any surprise to my regular readers, because they will know that I did talk about this in my editorial shortly before I went on last week's one-week hiatus. The IPCC prepares to release more hot air, where I talked about the report as it was as it was being prepared, as they were putting the finishing touches on it, and I told people exactly what to expect, and exactly as I predicted, yes! Oh, all the truth-tellers and truth-sayers over at The Real News, over at CNN. Planet has only until 2030 to stem ca catastrophic climate change. Experts warn. Experts. Uh, the world has just over a decade to get climate change under control, UN scientists say. Or, uh, you know, that, of course, coming from the Washington Post, democracy dies in darkness, or in $600 million contracts between the CIA and Amazon. But hey, who's who's counting? And uh, The Guardian. Oh, our good friends at The Guardian, who, of course, you will remember, won the Fake News Awards of the year at the beginning of this year for their fake news about uh, Syria and the White Helmets. Well, here they are in 2018 with a good good contender for this year's fake news awards. We have 12 years to limit climate change catastrophe, warns UN. And if that is a bit surprising or confusing for the G Guardian's readers, well, at least you're paying attention to what the, the propaganda that they're pumping out. Because, of course, we remember just uh, last year, the world only had three years left to stop dangerous climate change, warn experts. <laughs> and if you don't remember that story, where, of course, it was 2020 was the magical cutoff date before it suddenly became 2030 this year. Hey, we must be doing something right. If you don't remember that story, I did, of course, cover that in my uh, video last year, UN warning, just three years left to save the Earth, where I really hope you'll go and watch that if you haven't already. I go through all of the different examples going back to the 1980s, the U UN uh, environmental program director saying the Earth will be doomed by 2000, and Paul Ehrlich, of course, with his Earth will be doomed by 1980, and uh, the uh, Pachauri saying it was already too late, and uh, Prince Charles giving the Earth 96 months, but that was about 95 months before I made this video, so <laughs> only one month left to save the Earth. Well, now it's back to 12 years left to save the Earth, according to experts. Actually, I like how these headlines experts warn, and then UN scientists say, and then simply warns UN. <laughs> it's getting actually closer to the truth with that Guardian head, like, yeah, it is the UN that is specifically warning about this. And why do I say that? It is because, specifically, the IPCC report, here this, uh, like all their, all their assessment reports, but this report as well, is a political document. And I say that advisedly. I say that every time I write about the IPCC, but I still think this idea, this fundamental piece of the puzzle is not sunk in for a lot of the people out there. It is a political document, not a scientific document. And again, I say that advisedly, and we can see that from even the mainstream environmental sources that are all on board with the climate change hoax. Uh, down to earth .org .in. Um, reported just a couple of weeks ago about this IPCC report as it was being prepared, countries negotiate key messages of IPCC's controversial special report, where they're talking about the parties are negotiating the text of the summary for policymakers, which is a condensed version of the key messages and findings of the main report. Now, you read that and you gloss over what that actually is telling you, and you might suspect that, oh, well, they have this scientific report, and they're just trying to negotiate over the summary. You know, how to make the summary. No, that is not what it means. The summary is negotiated as a political document, as even mainstream environmental sources freely and readily admit. This one has been un under negotiation by the diplomats at the UN, not the scientists. The diplomats are arguing over this since uh, January of this year. And you can tell that, actually, they even admit it in this report that it is the summary for policymakers, this admittedly political document that then determines the text 
of the supposed scientific report that that summary is supposedly summarizing. <laughs> you cannot make this stuff up. But please, go. Go to changes to the underlying scientific technical assessment to ensure consistency with the approved summary for policymakers. And uh, you can go and read through exactly how they have changed the, uh, the scientific report to be in line with this admittedly political document. This is a political document. It is not a scientific document. That's one of the things that we have to highlight about this that never, ever gets talked about by anybody on either side of this issue. Assuming there's only two. There's always more than two. But what does this document actually say? What is it actually about? Well, you can go read through the document. You can go to the press release or the FAQ. Let's go to the frequently asked questions and take a look through here where they're talking uh, about some of the questions. Why are we talking about 1.5 degrees Celsius? Good question. How close are we to 1.5 degrees Celsius? What kind of pathways limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius? What do energy supply and demand have to do with limiting warming? Blah, blah, blah. And uh, please do go read through it. Go and read through what the UN's IPCC is uh, telling everyone with regards to the settled science of... Uh, the 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming that we're going to try to limit the Earth to using the magical global adjustment therm therm uh, thermostat known as carbon dioxide, which itself is utterly ludicrous and laughable, as I've detailed many times on the program. But let's look, for example, in question 1.2, how close are we to 1.5 degrees Celsius, where they admit, just in passing, and again, most people, if they even bother to read this FAQ, will just gloss over this, but they say, the choice of pre-industrial reference period, i.e. they're comparing the current global average surface temperature to the temperature over a given pre-industrial period to identify how much global warming has taken place since the birth of the industrial era, and they choose 1850 to 1900, and they're talking about that. The choice of pre-industrial reference period, along with the method used to calculate global average temperature, can alter scientists' estimate of historical warming by a couple of tenths of a degree Celsius. Such differences become important in the context of a global temperature limit just half a degree above where we are now. <laughs> you don't say? But provided consistent definitions are used, they do not affect our understanding of how human activity is influencing the climate. <laughs> Please, reread this for the heart of thinking. They are telling you that the error bars on the, their own admitted error bars on this already fudged data that I've talked about many times. Please go back to my rather comprehensive video on what is average global temperature to understand the, the fraud and how it's being perpetrated. But they admit that their ed error bars on this fudged data is half the size of what they are talking about in regards to this extra half degree of warming we have to go until we reach that magic 1.5. Half the size of the temperature change they're talking about. For anyone with any training in science and statistics, you will know how much garbage is being thrust down your throat. Oh yeah, half a degree Celsius. But you know, our measurement is ha uh, half of that, uh, um, the error bars are half of that size. It's insanity. And this insanity just keeps going on and on and on. And they talk, for example, about Oh, they use a 30-year time span to account for effective natural variability, which can cause global temperatures to fluctuate from one year to the next. For example, 2015 and 2016 were both affected by a strong El Nino event, which amplified the underlying human-caused warming. Well, first of all, how are they separating the human-caused warming from the natural variability that they admit to? But also, the way they phrase this is that the natural variability can cause global temperatures to fluctuate from one year to the next, as if it's just it's just random. One year it'll be hot and one year it'll be cold, and that's natural variability. But humans are making it hot every single year. Uh, well, boo, wrong, of course. Self-evidently, obviously wrong. Uh, look at the temperature of the planet Earth for the last 500 million years. And yes, you do see certainly this stochastic rhythm of up and down and up and down and up and down, but there are larger trends that are followed up and down and down and down and down and down and down and down. And then there's very dramatic swings in the Pleistocene. And then you get into the Holocene and you get the uh, coming out of the, the past ice age, of course, we get uh, uh, increase in temperatures. But also uh, look at this 
ridiculous drawn, <laughs> hand drawn in MS Paint uh, red line that we get to help show the dramatic hockey stick. Oh my god, global warming! When, of course, this does not follow <laughs> the Antarctica data set that they're actually showing here. There's a definitive downward trend, and then an upward trend, and then a leveling off. But this red line that's just been crudely drawn on by MS Paint <laughs> is. Uh, following some non-existent trend and uh, is up and down and then up! <laughs> and of course, the up is itself a lie, as we've been over many times. Again, look at my global average temperature video. Look at the other videos I've done on the subject. And oh, inconvenient timing, the first and only ever audit of the Met Office's Hadley Center, the Climate Research Unit's Hadcrut, global average surface temperature data set, which, as my viewers will know, but probably 0.001% of the general public will know, is one of the main data temperature sets that are used to calculate this global average temperature number that they tell you is rising every single year. Hottest year ever, hottest year ever. Total croc. Uh, it's one one hundredth of a degree Celsius warmer than last year, even though our error bars are <laughs> two tenths of a degree. <laughs> Again, utterly utterly scientifically meaningless nonsense that they're trying to put out there. But, oh, look at this. The first ever audit of the data in Hadcrit shows incredible absurdities that have somehow or other escaped the attention of these experts for 70 years. For example, there are cases of tropical islands recording a monthly average of zero degrees. This is the mean of the daily highs and lows for the month. A spot in Romania spent one whole month averaging minus 45 degrees. One site in Colombia recorded three months of over 80 degrees Celsius. That is so incredibly hot that even the minimums there were probably hotter than the hottest day on Earth. In some cases, boats on dry land seemingly recorded ocean temperatures from as far as 100 kilometers inland. The only explanation that could make sense is that Fahrenheit temperatures were mistaken for Celsius, and for the next 70 years at the CRU, no one noticed. I will, of course, put the link into this, uh, this article so you can read more about this first and only ever audit of the data under Hadcrut. Again, one of the main global temperature data sets that uh, these climate experts are using to tell us this nonsense scare story, but... This is it in a nutshell. This is what they're trying to get us to believe. But, of course, what do the media report? Oh, until 2030, 2030, we have 12 years left to save the planet. After we told you, you only have three years left to save the planet. Whatever, who cares? It's settled science. Don't question these obvious self-contradictions. <laughs> it just keeps getting stupider and stupider. But I wish it was only stupid. I wish it was only laughable nonsense that we could all say, look at that propaganda, ha ha ha. It's so obviously self-contradictory nonsense, we don't even have to consider it. Unfortunately, we do have to consider it. And why is that? It's because of things like this. Uh, the UN uh, FCCCs, the uh, if, if memory serves me correctly, that's the United Nations Federation of Climate Change Cultists? Uh, no, no, the United Nations uh, Foundation for Climate Change Cash? Oh, I can't remember. Something like that. The UNFCCC Secretariat welcomes the IPCC's Global Warming Report uh, of 1.5 degrees Celsius report. And again, uh, read through this. Please do read through this. Uh, of course they do welcome this report. Of course they do. Why? Because, of course, it fits the political agenda of the po politicians who are writing these documents. The politicians who are in the driving seat of the supposedly scientific report by the IPCC. Anyway, uh, as the UNFCC's uh, press release admits, according to the IPCC's report, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius is possible because we have that magic global therm thermostat. And, it's, of course, it's all about carbon dioxide, one of the smallest trace gases in the atmosphere. And we can dial it down by tenths of a degree that we can't even measure, given our own admissions of our error bars. Anyway, according to the IPCC's report, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius is possible, but requires unprecedented transitions in all aspects of society. If that phrase does not send a chill down the spine of everyone in the audience, then you are not 
paying attention to the loving arms of the United Nations and the globalists who are, oh, oh, so concerned about humanity. To minimize further global warming, we will need to achieve zero net emissions by mid-century. Zero net emissions. How exactly do they propose to do that? What mechanism, precisely, are they going to use to get the Earth down to zero net emissions? Oh, that's right. The old gray prostitute herself, the New York Times, can tell us new UN climate report says, put a high price on carbon. And what does that ultimately mean? Well, it means either carbon taxes, cap and trade, maybe a combination of the two, but something along those lines. And ultimately, we'll have rationing for the popul- You know? I, once again, it's kind of funny. I think I've heard this stuff before. Where did I hear that? Let me rack my br- Oh, that's right. I have talked about this before. Would you live in a greener lifestyle if you could make money from it? Hmm, that may be possible if a government proposal for personal carbon emissions allowances is implemented under the scheme. Everyone in the UK would be allocated an annual carbon allowance. Stored electronically rather like a supermarket loyalty card, points would be deducted every time we buy or use non-renewable energy. For example, using electricity to power appliances in the home. Or travelling somewhere by plane. Or even buying petrol for your car on the forecourt. Now any points left over could then be sold back to a central bank. Are you still with us? And people who need more, like motorists who had used their allocations, could then pay for a top-up. Carbon rationing. Carbon trading. Carbon taxes. Cap and trade. Just as the technocrats of old envisioned a new economic order based on energy and governed by the dictates of scientists and engineers, so too does this modern form of technocracy envision an economic order in which energy is budgeted, priced, and traded by intergovernmental panels of scientists and the political caste that grows up around these institutions. The Environmental Protection Agency is not friv a frivolous agency. It is created to, yes, to regulate um, uh, carbon dioxide emissions. And uh, I have been saying to the West Virginia Coal Association, which for the most part doesn't believe in climate science. They don't believe there's a climate problem. And I have been saying to them for a number of years that that's wrong, in my judgment. There is a, the science is true. The science is unequivocally true. And that, that there is a price to carbon in their future. I said this a couple of months ago. Uh, there's a price to carbon in their future. But I believe that the cap-and-trade approach is the, the essential first step, partly because it is the only basis upon which we can envision a truly global agreement, because it's very difficult to imagine a harmonized global tax. A carbon tax or any other way of putting a carbon price um, is actually, from an economic point of view, the most effective and efficient way to do this, okay? You can regulate and you can do, you know, all kinds of things, but the nothing is as strong a market signal to the private sector as a carbon price, whether that be a carbon tax or whether it be a cap and trade, which is what California is doing, or any of the other measures that ultimately give you a carbon price. But that is the simplest, cleanest, most powerful, um, most powerful signal. So if that's possible, I'm with you. These measures are sold to the public as a way of penalizing the big oil interests that have spent the last century monopolizing the world's key resources and plundering the earth in the pursuit of profit. What they do not understand, because it has been deliberately obscured, is that it is these very interests that have been instrumental in creating these schemes in the first place. It's my understanding that back in 1997, when you were vice president, Enron's CEO, Ken Lay, was involved in discussions with you at the White House about helping develop this type of policy, this trading scheme. And uh, is, that, is that accurate? Is it inaccurate? It's, it's been reported. Uh, I, I, I don't know, but, but I, I met with uh, uh, Ken Lay, as lots of people did, before anybody 
knew, knew uh, that he was a right. crook. And, and clearly, it, you can see why so many of us are concerned about this type of cap-and-trade energy uh, tax that would be literally turning over this country's I energy economy. I didn't know him economy. well enough to call him Kenny Boy. Well, you, but you knew him well enough to help devise this trading scheme. All right, once again, if you do not understand the bigger picture of what is happening here and why it is that the literal oligarchs, literally the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and the royal families and all of the mainstream institutions, all of the uh, cor corporate bankster-funded establishment lapdog press institutions are 100% behind this agenda and pimping these UN reports, then please watch how and why Big Oil conquered the world. They are available for free on my website. But I note that as I am recording this video at this precise time, YouTube is down worldwide, and I can only imagine what might become, what, what might come of this incident, whatever Russian bots or whatever they're going to blame it on. At any rate, YouTube is down worldwide as I speak. So please, once again, just a reminder, even if I don't get censored off of YouTube, which I will eventually, maybe for videos like this, but at some point, I am not going to be on YouTube. How and why Big Oil is not going to be on YouTube. You will have to have your own copy. Download it from my server for free. Purchase a DVD. There you have a physical copy you can physically pass out to people, and you get to support the website. Of course, available at CorbettReport.com shop. The bigger picture is even bigger than the trillion-dollar climate scam that they're trying to run right now, which, of course, will generate oodles of money for certain corrupt politicians and people and corporations that are in the back pockets of the banksters. Yes, there is the monetary aspect to this, but it goes much deeper into the heart of the technocratic agenda itself by way of carbon eugenics. That's going to be one of the things that is going to try to get us into the technocratic enslavement grid. It is coming. It is coming. And you can see it clearly the way they hype these types of UN reports as if they are going to be the saviors of humanity. Newsflash, they're not. I'll keep drilling this point home, uh, despite the fact that there are a lot of people out there that don't like to hear this bitter message. It is horrible, and it is hard to swallow, and it is nightmarish, but it is the truth, and I will keep telling this truth until I get deplatformed from every platform, and even then, it will still be out there. Purchase your copy today. Thank you for joining us for this important edition of Propaganda Watch. Please spread this message. Available now from CorbettReport.com. Oil. The 19th century was transformed by it. The 20th century was shaped by it. And the 21st century is moving beyond it. But who gave birth to the oil industry? And what are they planning to do with that power in a post-carbon world? How and why Big Oil conquered the world? Watch the documentary for free or purchase a DVD copy at corporatereport.com slash bigoil.